Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojans Huddle, where we tell it like it is. Friends, Inside the Trojans Huddle is a game-like panel discussion with WeRSC columnists, staff writers, historians, and editorial board. We first start off with the pregame show, where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle, and then give you the latest USC football news. Let's meet this week's panelists. Mark Culkin, we are SC columnist, who writes the Monday Morass, Yay or Nay, and Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season football and basketball practice reports. Chris Arledge, former William Jewell College defensive back and team captain, and we are SC columnist, who writes the popular column Musings with Arledge, and is a graduate of the USC Law School. Kevin Bruce, former USC first team all-conference linebacker, and team captain for the 1975 Trojans, and a We Are SC columnist who writes defensively and offensively speaking after every USC game. And Greg Katz, that's me, your moderator and producer of Inside the Trojan Huddle, and a weekly We Are SC columnist who writes the obvious and not so obvious IMHO Sunday and is an active member of the Football Writers Association of America. Before we kick off this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle, here is the latest USC football news as of today's late Monday afternoon taping. With the season opener against Rice, uh, the Rice Owls in the Coliseum less than two weeks away, the number 14 USC Trojans concluded training camp early Saturday morning with a closed scrimmage. On Monday, fall semester classes began, and the balance of this week's practice schedule through this upcoming weekend are scheduled. The times are staggered. Uh, morning and afternoon practices, depending on the day. After last Saturday's scrimmage, Lincoln Riley revealed the probable starting offensive line with Andrew Voorhees at left guard, Fred Nealon at center, Justin Deed at your right guard, and Jonan Maheim at right tackle, with Cortland Ford and Bobby Haskins still battling it out at left tackle. Riley also said the D-line has a solid rotation of five to six players, and three players that have really improved from spring through the end of training camp. Riley said uh, Sierra Wright, safety Examarian Gordon, and offensive lineman Mason Murphy showed great progress. Riley also added that edge rusher Corey Foreman, who has been hurt, needs to practice so they can get him on the field. On Monday, Trojans offensive guard Andrew Voorhees and wide receiver Jordan Addison were named to the Associated Press preseason first team All-America team. And in case you hadn't heard, former USC offensive lineman Maximus Gibbs has officially entered the NCAA transfer portal. Gibbs left the USC football program without any official specific reason. And as a sign of the times, and according to ESPN's Pete Thamel, USC five-star class of 2023 quarterback com commit Malachi Nelson from Los Alamitos High in Southern California has signed an NIL deal with Clutch Sports, which was founded in 2012 by NBA superstar LeBron James and agent Rich Paul. For your information, in Malachi's first game of the prep season last week, he was 16 of 17 for 352 yards and five touchdowns. Nelson had scoring tosses of 63, 55, 50, 48, and 43 yards. And by the way, all of Nelson's damage was done in the first half as Malachi's Los Alamitos team cruised to a 41-0 crunching of Bakersfield Garces Memorial. And finally, friends, we are SC's Inside the Trojans Huddle. Greatly appreciate your viewer and listenership. And we encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube to click on the red subscriber and like buttons. It's greatly appreciated and it's free. And we encourage you to check out wersc.com and become a valued premium member of the best USC football and athletic news source around. Now, before we kick things off, just as the team is transitioning from the end of training camp to its regular season routine and schedule, so we'll inside the Trojans huddle, beginning with next week's game, a week preview in preparation for the Rice Owls. Here's a brief preview of what you can expect from the huddle during the regular season. During the regular season inside the Trojans huddle, we'll review the previous USC game, preview the Trojans' next opponent, and we'll continue to address USC football and college football-related topics, and of course, bring you musings with Arledge each and every week. And with the return of the regular season, our Inside the Trojans Huddle panel will give you our weekly predictions of Pac-12 non-conference and conference games, and of course, answer your viewer questions in our overtime period. 
So with that brief regular season schedule preview of Inside the Trojan Huddle, let's get right to it and transition uh, to our final training camp version of the huddle with our first quarter kickoff topic. Panel, many USC fans have lived through the glorious days of John McKay or John Robinson or the Pete Carroll eras, and for some, maybe all three eras. USC fans know what a national and conference title Cardinal and Gold team looks like. So telling it like it is, and let's be honest, it's been more than a decade since the Trojans have been consistently relevant as a national powerhouse. It is simply the truth. So, panel, let me ask each of you, what USC game was the last game or a year you saw, win or lose, that you felt satisfied that the Trojans at last lived up to its storied high standards? We are our leadoff, as always, Mark Culkin. When was the last time you thought USC looked like USC? So, you know, I, I actually had a conversation about this with somebody today because of your question, Greg. I needed, I needed my feelings validated on this one. Uh, so, you know, naturally, my first instinct was the Rose Bowl game with Sam Darnold and Clay Hilton as the head coach. Um, but it just, it, USC won, they won the Rose Bowl. That's always a, you know, another feather in the hat, so to speak another sword in the field, but it, it didn't really feel like a, a, a really good, strong, dominating USC team. So I said, all right, well, let's go back to 2011. Um, Matt Barkley's junior year, they were still under sanctions. That was a pretty good team. And had they been eligible for the conference championship game, who knows what happens? So because they weren't, I have to go back to 2008. The year they didn't make it to the uh, BCS game, they did finish, what, 12-1, and one, I think, was their final, final record. But that team was dominant. And because of the way the BCS was set up and Tebow cried his way into the championship game and, you know, USC lost to Oregon State on the road, um, USC, the SEC got the benefit of the doubt that year. But... That was probably the most dominant team that I can remember that would, you know, meet the standard of a that USC fan set. Um, and they, and again, um, they didn't even get to play for the, for the trophy. They got the Rose Bowl. They won. It was great. But you have to go back to 2008, at least for me. What about for you, Chris Arledge? Uh, it didn't last very long, but September of 2017, <clears throat> The, um, you know, the previous year, the previous year was Clay Helton's first full year as head coach. Uh, when Helton got hired, I thought immediately it was the worst decision I'd ever seen. And I was furious and I complained about it a lot. In the first four games of that 2016 season, it looked like I was right because the team was an absolute disaster. But then they run off nine straight where, uh, where, you know, I thought they might, uh, I thought they might go into a death spiral like last year. They did. They won nine straight. They won the Rose bowl, come out the next year, play a shaky opener against Western Michigan, but they have a ranked Stanford team in game number two. And they just beat the tar out of that Stanford team. They absolutely manhandled them physically on both sides of the ball ran for over 300 yards, passed for over 300 yards, and blew them out. And that was back when Stanford, we thought, was still a, a pretty good football team and a tough football team. And USC just punched them in the face. That's the last time that I remember watching USC thinking, I think, I think we've got something here. This is a good football team. Um, by the end of that year, you couldn't believe that anymore, and it never got better after that. But, uh, yeah, for one night in September of 2017, I actually thought that maybe USC was was on its way back to the elite. All right, Kevin and Bruce, now, we, for those of you that are not watching a video, but I've been listening to a podcast here, we would like to call attention to Kevin's picture behind him. That is the young Kevin Bruce uh, in his El Capitan stage number 50 were very intimidating kevin uh was that on purpose that's because i wasn't getting paid nil money that's why <laughs> well i was going to mention that but i didn't want to make it feel bad <laughs> well, all right so kev 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 yeah um, when was the last time usc was usc now i imagine as a player at usc during the time period you came through which was national championships how frustrating must have been for you to go through a certain period of time 
But when, in your opinion, did USC last look like a USC team? Yeah, I really have to, and, and, and Chris makes a good point, but I, I would agree with Mark that 08 was, you know, a, a, a team that, you know, on the field, game in, game out, just played uh, lights out football, not always mistake free, you know, and, and, and such, but uh, really played that physical, um, well-disciplined, reasonably well-disciplined well uh, game. And, uh, and it was, and if, if you were trying to defend that offense, that was scary. But if you were trying to, to uh, play against that defense, that was even scarier. Um, they were, they were awesome. And, um, and so as a result, I think that was to, to my way of thinking and, and to my eye, uh, that team uh, was really the last one that kind of fit the, the, uh, the, within the box of a, a potential national championship style um, USC football team, which is something that we've, uh, you know, grown up with and, and, you know, uh, look forward to when that can, uh, uh, you know, recover because that's, this, that's what this is. This is a recovery from, you know, uh, you know, post Pete Carroll, post sanctions, post this, post that, post Helton, my gosh, you know, all those kinds of, of, uh, situations that have just been real headwinds to the program uh, this is this is a uh, reasonably clean slate opportunity and i'm looking forward to it and i just want to see the guys on the field play the type of usc football that we're accustomed to it's not mean it's not mistake free it's not penalty free shouldn't be frankly uh but it is uh really uh physically tough guys that are, are well positioned that will play through the whistle and then some and, uh, and when it gets in the fourth quarter, the other team has to know that they're going to be um, on the short end of the uh, score. All right. Well, listen, I'm going to say, uh, just to uh, give my brief little viewpoint on this, this will mark my 60th year of watching USC football, which began in 1962. So I have a big inventory of uh, what USC football looks like when it's USC football. But I'm going to agree with both uh, Mark uh, and Kev here, uh, that 2018 was the last time I thought USC looked like USC. The defense was hellacious. Uh, you know, uh, you know, people might sit there and say, well, you know, they had a big Rose Bowl win, you know, over Penn State. You know, look, at they were one Matt Bormeister missed field goal from an implosion at the highest level going, how could they give up 49 points or whatever it is? They, would, they should have lost. So one field goal changed the whole complexion of it. And uh, when you have a team in 2008, and you have captains like Brian Cushing and some of the others who were there, yeah. and Mark Sanchez, at quarterback, and Pete, of course, uh, you know, Pete was as competitive a coach as you'll ever find. I mean, he was definitely a guy who transitioned to how he played on with his team, especially on defense. So both of you guys, uh, I, I have to agree with you on that. So that actually... Uh, let's us transition to uh, the second quarter uh, with this topic. Uh, we discussed in the first quarter the last time each of us saw what we thought when SC looked like USC. So what will it take in 2022 for fans nationally and locally to be convinced that USC is back? Kevin, what's it going to take this season to convince others that USC is USC? You know, at, at minimum, team has to go into Utah undefeated and and then decisively beat Utah. What happens after that would be nice to finish the season undefeated and go on into to playoffs, et cetera. But um, having a shorter horizon to look at, uh, clearly that that's what I'm looking for. Uh, undefeated, go into Utah and take care of Utah on their field, a place we have not played well in ever that I can recall anyway. And that's a signature win. And that's what they need to do. Now, they have other opportunities against Notre Dame, UCLA, to um, further that thereafter, should they execute that opportunity, right? Um, and, I, and I would welcome that, of course. But, but minimum, short term, uh, that, that's what I'm looking for. If, if they were to collapse after that, that's obviously not a good thing. Um, Things can happen. I don't expect that to be the situation. I expect the team to get better. 
but injuries will play a role in this team and so forth. It plays a role for every team. So this it's not like, you know, everybody gets away scot-free on injuries. It just depends who, what, where, and when, right, on, on the injuries on the injury front. But I'm looking forward to that. Our, our undefeated team going into Utah and beating Utah. You agree with that, Colton? Um, yeah, I, I think at the minimum, I, that, that's what they should be. You know, Scott, asked, Scott Schrader asked the question on, on the WeRFC board today. I uh, well, didn't really ask the question. He made a predict, his prediction, nine and three. And I think that's a fair assessment. But here's the thing. USC is going to be a hard team to evaluate as far as, you know, are they back? Because they're going to be so marginally razor thin on defense. I mean, as you talk about injuries, they're barely getting through fall camp and fall practice right now with a full Russian position group. That's why they've moved Tuli Tuiapolotu out there as well to see what he can do. So USC can get that nine and 10 wins, but it might not be, they might not be pretty wins. And are you going to say they're back if they have nine wins or are they back with 10 wins? So it's going to be an eyeball test. You know, obviously anything more than four wins is going to be an improvement. Um, so I, I guess if I'm sitting the bar, it's going to be a 10 win season and it, they have to look like they're getting better throughout the year. And, you know, Chris brought up in the first quarter, Go punch Stampin' in the mouth in that first road game. Start getting some payback for all those ass whoopings you got at home last year. That's how USC can prove their back. The revenge tour. Play it yeah. loud. The revenge tour. Yeah, Is it going to be a revenge tour, Arledge? What, what's it going to take for the, na- for the nation to stand up and say, wow, this is the SC I remember? Well, it depends what you mean by that. If you want people to recognize that USC is is back on track, then maybe nine win gets you that. People will say, okay, I mean, he's turning things around, they look better. But nine wins against this schedule uh, does not mean you're back. Nine wins against this schedule means that you're an okay football team, right? An average USC football team goes nine and three against this schedule. It's just not very tough. Uh, you have, you know, you have one really difficult road game. And, uh, and that's it. So, uh, but if you want the, if you want the nation to think that USC is back, you have to go 11 and one, you have to win the two games that everybody's going to watch Utah and Notre Dame, because everybody's going to watch those two games. Those are going to be talked about. You have to win those two. And then you have to avoid the Clay Helton specials where you're playing against a horrific team an Arizona or someone like that. And you win 21 to 17 with 12 penalties. You, you have to avoid that because even if you win, if people actually turn on the game and they watch that sort of football, they'll know we're not back. Um, Clay Helton won a lot of football games where USC looked absolutely dreadful. He also lost a lot of football games where USC looked yeah. dreadful. Uh, <clears throat> USC is not back, though, until they can go through a schedule like this and go 11-1. I don't know that they're going to do that this year. They can. There's nobody on the schedule they can't be, but that's a pretty tall order. But that's what it's going to take. But I think if uh, you know if you get nine wins, ten wins, then people will see the improvement and and buy into the program. Well, they say perception is reality, so I think what all of you have said brings perception into reality. I think they have to be undefeated when they play Utah. I'm not sure they have to beat them decisively. I think they have to look good beating them. Uh, hopefully, Utah gets by their little uh, excursion in the first game to uh, at, at the Swamp in Florida. That'll have a great deal of uh, meaning when the two uh, play each other, SC and uh, Utah. So assuming that SC can beat Utah on probably national TV in prime time, if both are undefeated, that will be a huge step. Uh, then I think uh, I'm not going to underestimate UCLA as far as victories go, because I think when UCLA hosts Oregon, uh, I think I think they they host Oregon. Um, that will have a bearing yeah. on what of what perception will look like. But let's assume for argument's sake that UCLA outscores Oregon. It's possible SC and UCLA could be undefeated uh, when they face each other in the Rose Bowl in uh, November. 
But then it comes down to our old friends from South Bend, Notre Dame, and a lot could be on the line. Uh, obviously, college football playoffs. Obviously, uh, a Heisman Trophy could be won. We know that Carson Palmer did it against Notre Dame. And if Caleb Williams uh, continues to mature, his uh, positioning in the Heisman race could be decided on that one. Uh, you know, originally I thought nine and three was a reasonable but not impressive nationally. But then when I started going over the schedule, I said, is there anybody on this schedule that I could say they don't have a chance against? And the answer is they should be favored in every game uh, with possibly the exception, although uh, Las Vegas odds makers have Utah right now uh, as an underdog to SC. And I think even when SC, honestly, if they were to ring the bell, if they got in the college football playoffs, then I think people would say SC's back as long as they don't embarrass themselves. Uh, if they're the fourth seed and Alabama's number one. But if they went into the Rose Bowl and they won, or they go to the Cotton Bowl and they win, that would be a hell of a season to me. And uh, I agree with Chris. I think 11 and one is going to, would be the, the, the bellwether game and hopefully uh, they can get there, but you know what? It's going to be, as Mark said, you know, that defense really, you know, it, it makes Maybe me, older person. Person. yeah, it makes me nervous when I see the Thule's being tried at D at rush end uh, and everything else. So we'll see. And here's the thing, Greg. You know what? If yeah. you if you see undefeated going into Utah and they leave Salt Lake City with the win, I don't care if they win two to nothing. It doesn't matter how they win. They're gonna. That's gonna gain a lot of national attention. It doesn't matter if they dominate or if they eke out a win. I'll take. A I'm not convinced Utah is gonna be undefeated going into there that you go. game. I mean, they could easily lose at the Swamp, and they could lose at the Rose Bowl the week before the USC game. I mean, that UCLA and Greg, UCLA is not going to be undefeated in that game. That's crazy talk. They are too wildly inconsistent, but they're dangerous. They're dangerous. That offense is going to score some points, and playing in the Rose Bowl, it would not shock me if they knocked off Utah, especially if Utah's looking ahead the next week to USC. I mean, that's so I, I think USC probably will be undefeated going into the to that game unless they uh, unless they overlook Fresno. Actually, uh, I think they'll be undefeated. I'm not convinced that Utah will be. I think Utah. I think Utah is going to take at least a loss before then, and I'm not convinced that Utah is the top ten team this year. Utah played in a lousy Pac-12 last year. A lousy Pac-12. They couldn't do anything to slow down Ohio State's offense. Utah is going to be pretty good offensively, but. And, and I know that, and I know that Kyle Whittingham is a good defensive coach. His guys are tough. They're disciplined. I get all that. I'm not convinced that Utah is going to be all that good defensively this year. Well, I tell you, they were uh, two plays away from beating Ohio State. So, and that they had no business being in that game. Absolutely, they, they really clawed their way back. I have to give them credit for that. They're and yeah. they're tough and tough oh, wow. as nails at home. And we have not played well at Reeser State or at, uh, at Utah. Right, Rice Eccles Stadium. Rice Eccles, yeah, I think. One Ohio, of those. State, Ohio State dumped their defensive coordinator after last year, by the way. So well, that's true. That's true. So, I, I so, 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 hey, by the way, so did we. Well, <laughs> theirs are definitely better than ours, but <laughs> point being, it, he wasn't up to Ohio State's level. Are, are, you, yeah. missing him? are you missing him already, Kevin? <laughs> Not a bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's Jim Moore's problem at UConn. Then. Well, I think we can all agree, uh, and I don't think it's crazy talk, by the way, that uh, the SC Utah game could be a real monumental game, a, 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 a pinnacle game for the Trojans. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you one thing, it's going to be a nutcase place having been to Rice Eccles a couple of times. Yeah. It, it'll be very interesting. Trust me. If, if Utah and USC are both undefeated, that's the biggest game in Utah football history. I mean, yeah. realistically, that's the biggest game in Utah football history. They win that game and they are, and they are favored to go to the, to the, uh, to the playoff. And this is a, I mean, Utah's only been playing at the upper level for about a, a decade, right? I mean, this is so you want to talk about you want to talk about a stadium that's going to be out of control energy wise. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be insane. 
So I, I'm not I'm not trying to dismiss Utah as as a tough opponent or as a tough out because I think Utah needs to be favored in that game. Yeah, I'm just saying Utah didn't even slow down Ohio State in that Rose Bowl for the most part. They gave up forty something points, and that was an Ohio State team that had some of their better players sitting out. USC is going to score on that Utah team. They're going to. Whether they can stop them or not, I don't know. Well, one factor, and then we're going to move to halftime here. SC could play Utah again in the Pac-12 championship game. It's possible two teams with the best winning percentage in the conference are going to play. So, you know, maybe SC, to be honest with you, maybe SC doesn't win at Utah, but then comes back and wins in the Pac-12 title game, which would show improvement and getting better. Uh, so there is also that way of looking at it. And of course you can look at it opposite of SC wins at Utah, but loses in the championship game. Uh, that would not be, uh, what I'd say uplifting, but I'll tell you what is uplifting <laughs> halftime. According to a story in the athletic, the USC football Jersey numbers that will be on sale to the public without names on the back will be numbers one, 22, 55 and 80. But how or why were these numbers selected? The Trojans bookstore explained it this way. Number one is for not being number one. Number 22 is for the 2022 season. 55 is for all the players and historical value associated with that number defensively. And number 80, because USC was founded in 1880. It should be noted, however, that USC jerseys like quarterback Caleb Williams, number 13, with Caleb's last name on the back, can be purchased through a private off-campus company. So, panel, your reaction to the bookstore numbers selected for public purchase, and perhaps even more importantly to me, the explanation given for selecting those specific numbers. Chris, do you have uh, some thoughts on this? I can't wait to buy that number 80 jersey too because <laughs> USC was founded in 1880. That's really good marketing. None of that makes any sense. Look, I understand that I understand that putting number 13 up there is a potential conflict with Caleb Williams and his ability to market his own jersey. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that where the star players are selling their jerseys elsewhere. Uh, and they either do that or USC needs to cut a deal with their where they're sending money back to the, uh, to the player uh, for that, uh, for that Jersey number. Yeah. Um, pay a royalty on it. Yeah. They should always look, they should always sell 55. Realistically, they should always sell 55. It's the most iconic number in USC history. They should probably sell the Heisman numbers uh, too. Um, number one's a good one, but you know, somebody's going to buy number 80 because USC was found in 1880. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I've heard lots of dumb things. So I, I don't get that at all, but whatever. <laughs> well, whatever. How do you feel about that, Kevin? Is it whatever, or do you sit there and say how ridiculous was the explanations of how they select these uniform numbers? I know I'm going to be running out and getting in. A, a yeah, I, I, I think they just had so many stencils, so many stencils, and that's what the numbers worked out for. That was it. Had no, no rhyme or reason to it. Like, oh, the university was founded in 1880. Well, the football team was probably founded in 1882. <laughs> so, you know, I use that one. That one's probably probably not true, but it's probably better. Um, I, I think the whole thing is kind of goofy. Chris brings up a good point, though. There's a there's a uh, potential conflict on NIL money. Uh, for uh, use of uh, jersey numbers. However, th th there is a question. So who owns the jersey number? Who owns the right to, a, to assign the jersey number? The university does. Yeah, without the name on the jersey, the player doesn't really have an argument, I don't think. Exactly. USC, I think. USC, what, was USC Obannon, what was the whole Ed O'Bannon video game thing then? If, you know, with the name image likeness with the jersey and, numbers but the video game had more than just the, it had more I'm than not just a video the game jersey. person that's why i'm asking yeah so it had more than just the jersey number yeah it had a it had a description <clears throat> of the player and you have all kinds of other data that matches up that player with that with the player on the video game you could get away selling the juries they own the they own the trademark i don't think that's an issue but nor do i think usc should do that right i mean if if you have a 
if you have a, 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 a potential Heisman winning quarterback and you're selling his jersey and, and locking him out of the profits on the jersey, you are not helping yourself recruit right. the next Heisman winning quarterback. That's right. It, it's it's dumb. It, you could probably get a. That's probably you know uh, if you get greedy, you know, uh, not not a smart move. And you're right on that. Pay a royalty. Pay 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 some big, and everybody's happy. Mark, what do you, what do you think? Did you buy jerseys when you were younger? Did no, you... no, 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 no. Not your thing. It's just, it's not my thing. And you know what? I'm. I gotta say the the. The amount of disrespect you guys have been showing to John Jackson III and every player who's worn number 80, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, I didn't write that press release. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Whoever thought that was a good press release should probably be reconsidered for another position in that department. <laughs> um, yeah, it, look. One makes sense. You've got a couple of young players who are, are probably going to be profiled this year. Gary Bryant Jr., Damani Jackson, both of those guys wear the number one. Darwin Barlow wears number 22. I'm never going to associate that number, that, that number with the year that they're selling it. The same with, you know, as Chris and Kevin pointed out, 1880 does not ring a bell with the jersey number 80. So look, they're trying a lot of new stuff in the USC marketing department with social media. This wasn't one of their better ideas. No, no. Is it, guys? You think that this is going to force USC to become? Right now, they're the only team uh, to not have names on the back of the jerseys at the big time uh, FBS level. Uh, is this going to force them? to put names on the back. And I'll give you, get your thoughts on this. Look, if Caleb wins the Heisman Trophy, you know that USC wants a, wants a little bit of uh, the piece of the pie on that one. You know, it's their own number 13. What uh, if Jordan Madison wins it? Well, and that's a, that's another good point. It's already a retired Heisman winner. What do, you, how do, what do you do with that jersey now? I mean, do you, do you double platinum? What do you do to it? Well, I will say this. I thought they devalued number 55 by the way they've treated number 55 the last decade. I, you know, using it as a recruiting tool and all that sort of stuff where it lost its meaning. Uh, you know, they've taken numbers out of retirement, whatever. But I'm starting to think that as much as I like the idea of the tradition of no names on the back, I'm starting to think that in this day and age, you might have to consider it. Uh, for the players' benefit and for the schools, because the school is going to lose out on well, that. Then I, I charge. At, then I. Then I look. I if I put the names on the back of the jerseys, then the NIL money that player is getting, they're going to give me a piece of it as a university. Sorry, well, I just want to ask you, Kevin. Is it a coincidence that you have a picture of yourself in the number fifty jersey? No, I just ran. Are out you pictures. planning? Are you planning on selling that for for the many people who have contacted me? That they want a Kevin Bruce number fifty jersey. Yeah, both of them, uh, mom and dad. Um, yeah, no worries. Uh, call me; uh, I can make them available. <laughs> oh, hey, I, I want one. If 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 we're gonna pass out Kevin Bruce jerseys, I want one. I didn't know that was even an option. Mark, yeah, you, you want a Kevin Bruce number fifty? I, I haven't quoted. I haven't quoted a price yet either. I, I'd like fair. the helmet. Can I have the helmet? No, that's uh, that's not for sale. Now look at look at now isn't this typical, Culkin? We try to do a little jersey. Now he even wants the guy's helmet. Next thing you'll tell me is, you, do you still have your cleats? Do you still have your socks? Where you is all my jock? Yeah. Okay, well now we're okay. Here we go. Here we go. Look at Kevin. I've never seen Kevin so happy after he said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just saying it. I know. Well, you know it. Uh, it, you make a big, a good egg salad point there. So, all right, guys, let's transition here. Before we begin the second half, a reminder that you're watching or listening to WeRSC.com inside the Trojans huddle. Uh, this week's panelists are Mark Culkin, Chris Arledge, and Kevin Bruce. I'm Greg Katz. We also encourage you to check out the WeRSC.com's website, part of the On3 network, and become a subscriber to the best coverage of USC football and recruiting and overall USC athletics. 
And as a reminder, WeRSC.com is offering a one-week free trial of WeRSC.com, which includes breaking stories, analysis, recruiting, and data for USC football, basketball, and the balance of athletics. So with that, we kick off the second half and the third quarter with this. Actually, it's a two-part question. Part one, first, according to sources cited by ESPN, the College Football Playoff Board, a.k.a. the CFP, through a Zoom conference call, uh, briefly began discussing what would dramatically change the way college football is governed. Briefly discussed was the idea that major college football could potentially be governed outside the NCAA and through the auspices of the college football playoffs. <laughs> Panel, your thoughts on this potentially new governance of college football in the future? Mark, what do you think? The sooner the better. I mean, let's just end this charade already. Um, it's time that, you know, major Division I football separate itself from the have-nots. Get a commissioner in place, form the Superpower League, and let's just get the ball rolling. Right? All they're doing is kicking the can down the road. Let's just get the, just get it started so we can move forward. It's going to happen eventually. Chris, how soon is eventually, and are they kicking the can down the road? Well, I, I don't think anybody really knows what to do yet, but the, the direction is clear. This is going to happen. It, it never made sense. The, the NCAA has been a, a corrupt and feeble organization for quite some time, but it never really made sense to have Alabama, USC, Notre Dame, and programs like that being governed by the same rules that govern where you, William Jewell College. It doesn't make sense. They're, they're, two, they're, they're playing in two completely different marketplaces. So yeah, the, the big power programs are going to have to break off. If they break off, they're going to have the money, especially with an expanded playoff. They're going to have the money where you can pay players a salary, cut a deal with uh, a player's union so that you can then have enforceable rules in place that won't run afoul of the anti-monopoly laws. Uh, and then you have a chance to bring some order to the chaos. I think that's what's going to happen. And it may take a few years, but it's probably not going to take much more than a few years. I'd be surprised if three years from now, this hasn't already been done. Um, but also keep in mind, the people who run universities are by and large academics, right? The presidents are. Um, they're not business people. And, um, and they have a governing structure that involves all kinds of committees all over the place and all kinds of people that have to be consulted. They are it turning, making, uh, making, uh, making moves as universities like trying to turn around a tanker ship. I mean, it takes a long time and it's very difficult. So it doesn't surprise me that these guys are struggling with how to, with how to respond. They're not gonna be nimble. But it is going to happen. It has to happen. I don't see an alternative to it. What do you think, Kev? Is, uh, is it uh, going to happen? And how much do you think that this approaching expansion of the playoffs, let's just say, and we'll talk about this uh, in the second part of the question here, yeah. how much is there like an unwritten deadline for these schools to finally say, well, we need our own governing body and we need it now? It's not driven by time. It's driven by money. Um, and therefore it can go much more quickly than people might think. The, um, the genie that was in the bottle that's been let out is the fact that any pretense of amateurism is gone, long gone. And okay, so with, with that done, now it's a question of uh, driving the economics of a very, very popular product. Um, I would argue that to, uh, if the NFL didn't have a longer schedule, uh, more games in their schedule, the, uh, uh, the, the revenues derived from D1A football would be higher. And if I was running the show, that would be my target. My, my competition is NFL. It's not the rest of the D1A schools, right? And uh, I, my, my guess is <clears throat> that um, someone could be very successful competing against the NFL uh, with uh, a lot more um, jerseys to sell, a lot more numbers to sell. Well, I'll tell you, I think that uh, I think we're on a countdown 
Uh, I think it's all about money, uh, which I think all of you would agree about. The more money, the more they want to get things done. Um, I think it's one thing that college football has learned and is known for a while, that under the NCAA, they saw how much money from that NCAA basketball tournament was going to the NCAA as opposed to the member schools. And there's no way in hell are they going to sit there and allow all that money to go to the NCAA with here, have a crumb here, have a crumb yeah. there. We'll make yeah. you happy. I mean, you think the SEC is going to go along with that idea? Yeah, well, unfortunately, what happened, certainly within the Pac-12, is it went to the conference, a lot of the money, uh, versus to the universities. That was idiocy. It was it was baked into the the agreements and such and, and to, into the tradition. But it was driving schools like OUSC crazy just to have to split, uh, you know, postseason uh, earnings, you know, with an Oregon State. I mean, e equal amounts. It's just silly, uh, but but required by uh, conference rules. Um, those rules are like uh, uh, gone, right? And uh, the other conferences make no pretense about having to abide by that. They, they could care less. Um, it's uh, now, and I think this goes back to last week's uh, show where we're talking about the uh, the idiots and crooks. I think it was Chris's terms um that uh, run the uh, nc2a and my point was idiot and crooks that run the universities um you know there's just you know a different crowd of idiots and crooks um now let's just let's just get it all out there and uh, it, there's a lot of money to be made here and i and i truly believe this that the, the product the d1a product or whatever you're supposed to call it i call it d1am i, I don't learn well um is a more popular product per unit of viewing viewership than the NFL. Now, it is not a more popular product yet uh, in Las Vegas. All right, well, let's transition into the second part of the question because I think it teams up with it. Sources also told ESPN that through a general conference call, the feeling among college presidents and chancellors was that too much money has been left on the table by not expanding the college football playoffs to at least 12 teams, and that as much as a half billion, billion dollars have been left on the table by not implementing a new playoff before 2026. While there's still a lot to be determined, there is the reality of the money situation, and there is currently little to no adamant feelings towards a 12-team playoff expansion in fact, there is now potential to put in place a new playoff format, perhaps as early as 2023. Panel, do you think that an acceleration of a new playoff format can and will happen before the 2026 contract expires? And how might that affect USC by moving up to a 12-team or possibly even a 16-team format by the 2023 season? Mark, what do you think? By the 23 season? I don't know. I know by the time USC joins the, the big conference in the 2024 season, they will have expanded the playoffs. You can't have two conferences that, that have teams such as Ohio State, USC, Michigan, Penn State, and then you've got the SEC with Alabama, Georgia, LSU, trying to squeeze you know four teams just out of that group would be a challenge if they're all having good seasons. So you're going to have to expand the playoffs just based on the direction these conferences are going. The conferences are going to want to have as much representation as possible. So once, you know, Texas and Oklahoma are official members of the SEC, USC and UCLA join the big. Yeah, I, I think by 2024, you're going to have the playoffs expanded. I don't think it'll happen by 23, but definitely when the, the super conferences are in play. Chris, are you? Are, what do you think? What's the timing on this? What's the sense of urgency on this? What do you think? The, pro the problem is, I think everybody would like to expand the uh, the playoff um, for the reason that that you talked about. There's way too much money not to do it. Here's the problem, though. This is only one of the moving pieces in college football. 
That's and true. if you're going to change, if you're going to change it early, you have to have unanimity. It's going to be really hard to get unanimity between the SEC, the Big Ten, and at this point, a struggling Big 12, a, a, an almost dead uh, Pac-12, an ACC that is locked into this terrible deal where the, where the top programs are trying to find a way out. I don't know how you get unanimity in this particular atmosphere, especially because even if it makes everybody richer, it's the relative gains that might matter most. So think about it this way. If you're the SEC and the Big and the Big Ten, what you're most focused on doing is separating yourselves from the pack. And while it might be better to have your teams make, say, 150 million instead of 100 million, what you really need to do is drown the other three in their bathtubs and have two super conferences where your programs are making far more money than anybody else and you're completely in control. If the Big Ten, if the Big Ten and the SEC landed Clemson, Notre Dame, Florida State, um, Oregon, Washington, Stanford, a hand, just a handful of additional teams, if they just did that, those two teams could have their own playoff. It doesn't really matter what anybody else does, and then they keep a hundred percent of that money. So I, I don't know. I don't know that it's going to be that easy because I think it's going to be a hard time to get unanimity, especially when you have three. Tw- you have three major conferences, and then you have the other guys. Yeah. Who, it used to be there were two tiers. Now there are three tiers, and two of those tiers are really disappointed with the current status quo. And the top tier is looking at it saying, I'm not sure we have to change much. We may be able to kill everybody else and just keep it all between the two of us if we play our cards right. So I think it's going to be hard, actually, to make yeah. this change. And I'm not well, going to get done early. You got a couple, a few independents, but one in particular that it, it, play your cards right. You sit back, you wait for the you know, the the need for unanimity drives the fact that the last guy holding the card holds all the cards, right? And I'm thinking Notre Dame. If I was Notre Dame, I would just wait until all the stuff goes back and forth and say, all right, here's what's going to cost you guys to get us in. Because I'm not in a conference I'm on D1A football. I am on other sports, not football. And you and you need me. Just like what they did with the NBC contract. The same dang thing. And it worked. And it worked well, frankly. You know, say what you want, but it was successful. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see how this thing progresses. It it will, it's this is a this is a uh, heavy lift. Um, it's a lift that'll be done because the money will drive it, but it's a heavy lift. It's complicated too, really complicated. I see, I, as I, I see it, I think I that, think uh, that uh, they learned um, from the last debacle uh, about expanding that they lo- they all lost. Uh, the fact that it was mentioned that they nearly a half a billion dollars. I don't think they want to go down that road again. They've had enough time to think about uh, all the problems that you guys have brought up. I think that I don't think at this point it's that difficult to do. Uh, because they've had a chance to think about it. I think Notre Dame uh, is maybe getting a little bit too much credit than it deserves because Notre Dame wants a slice of that money. And whatever yeah. they said, whatever they said yeah. Notre Dame, we, we don't really worry about Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah, you, you just, that's a game of chicken. Fine, you want to play it, fine. That's negotiation. Uh, it's going but, to, I think it's going to be. Well, uh, but you, when you look at the TV ratings, you go, whoops, uh, maybe we don't want to play that game of chicken. Let's just, you know, uh, have, Let uh, you, Kevin, let's, let's, let's agree to do something smart here. If there really is a half a billion dollars worth of money left on the table, who, who, got, who's, who took it? Because it ain't on the table right now. So who's got it right now? Who's got that half a billion dollars? Is it the networks? Is it the conferences? Is it the universities? Is it scattered all over the place? Right now, it's scattered all over the place. <laughs> Chris, and now, it, it, Notre Dame has, keep in mind, Notre Dame has leverage right now because, because the SEC doesn't want the Big Ten to get Notre Dame. Correct. And so the SEC is not going to agree to anything that would lock the Notre Dame, that would lock Notre Dame out of a playoff because once Notre Dame knows it's going to get locked out of a playoff, it's going to join the Big Ten. It's not going to join the SEC. That's not a fit. So the SEC is not going to allow any changes that would lock Notre Dame out. Um, and both of and 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 none of the other three 
three major conferences and certainly the, the third tier conferences, none of them are going to do anything that will increase the stranglehold that the Big Ten and the SEC currently have on college football. Because right now, the difference between those two conferences and everybody else is stark. And all it takes, I mean, think about it, all it takes is a couple of additions. Clemson, Florida State, Miami jump. Notre Dame jumps to the Big Ten. Washington and Stanford say go to the Big Ten. You have those moves and everybody else is irrelevant. Nobody cares about freaking Baylor. Baylor has a good coach. They were a good team last year. Nobody cares about Baylor. Nobody cares about Oregon State. Those teams, those remaining conferences completely disappear. Those guys have to do what they can to protect themselves. And so everything they do is going to be designed not just to increase the total revenues in college football, but designed to make sure that their conferences don't die and take <laughs> all of the remaining, all of those teams in the, in the ACC, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 that aren't the big dogs, all of those teams are scared to death. They're going to get left behind and they're going to find themselves in the equivalent of the Mac or the Big Sky. That's what they think is going to happen. And as long as that is animating their thinking, they are going to be extraordinarily careful about how they vote when it comes to playoffs and the like. And, and, and if they're going to expand so that everybody can make more money, they're going to, they're going to do it in such a way that protects their interest. Uh, and I'm not sure that their interests are the same as the Big Ten and the SEC. So I just think it's really difficult to do. And, and I don't think it's going to get done early. I think after, after the current uh, setup runs out in a few years and they have to replace it with something, then I think it will get replaced. And then I think the last of the, of the big dogs in the, in, the, in, the, in the other three conferences will make their jump. And then you'll have two super conferences and they'll get it done. And it won't really matter what anyone else thinks. See, that's why I think it'll go to 16 teams. Uh, I think having four extra teams will satisfy the have not, so to speak. It'll give them more of an opportunity. However, with that being said, we need to move on. And we all know what this means. We begin the fourth quarter of Inside the Trojan Subtle with the traditional lighting of the Chris Arledge Coliseum torch. Uh, you may all hum to yourselves while I'm doing this. Uh, the William Tell Overture. Uh, it's, the reminder, it's the William Jewell Overture, to be clear. Well, I was going to say that. You know, did you notice, Kevin, how he dropped in the William Jewell University plug there when he was talking? I know where he was going. William Jewell College. We, we're not even a university. But, I'm, you know, I'm doing what I can. Dan Lanning and, and, and Bill Snyder and I are all doing our, uh, our best to promote the album. <laughs> but you're better than Stanford because they're a junior college. That's we true. It, it, it's not. It, it hasn't been said very often that uh, that William Jewell College is better than Stanford. This may be the first time, but I think they'll appreciate it, Mark. You'll probably get a Christmas card from the administration there. Well, that being said, a reminder: any comments or opinions expressed by Chris Arledge are solely those of his own and not in any shape or form a reflection of the opinions of We RSC or the On Three Network. Any republication, rebroadcast, use, or other descriptions of musings with Arledge without the express written consent of the IRS and the Clyde Fendel Hesse fan club is strictly prohibited. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to you inside the Trojan settled version of Christopher Arledge's musings with Arledge. Thank you, Greg. You've all heard the sayings about putting lipstick on a pig or not being able to make chicken salad out of chicken but the opposite is also sometimes true. Sometimes you can take something of real value and you can just abuse it for years, leave it out in the elements, run over it in your car, set it on fire, but still the value remains. And just this past week, we got confirmation from what many of us believe to be true all along. The University of California has done the analysis, they published the results, and now we know for sure. USC football is still very valuable and the entire rest of the Pac-12 has been ungrateful free riders for years. Now, before we get into the UC's report, I want to keep in mind that these numbers have come out after USC has spent years self-sanctioning the program, doing worse damage than Paul D. ever did. Yeah. This is important. I want you to keep in mind just how hard USC has worked to destroy the value of its famous football program. I mean, Pat, K Pat Hayden took the keys to the Ferrari and gave them to a drunk guy. I mean, literally he did that. 
Now, maybe that seemed reasonable to Pat because maybe Sark was less drunk than he was. I don't know, but that's what he did. And after firing seven win, 50 proof Sark, he then asked Clay Clampett to load up the pickup truck in Kentucky and bring his faith family football to Troy. We got his family. I suspect he brought the faith. The football portion never actually arrived. That lasted six years. Now, I'm reliving this terrible history because I want you to keep in mind just how much damage has been done voluntarily. What USC has done is sort of like if the Beatles, immediately after releasing Sgt. Peppers, decided to take six years off to tour as the Wiggles, singing songs about fruit salad to first graders. And Greg, I know you're too old to understand that reference, but those are the small kids now. Had they done that, it might have put a damper on the whole Beatlemania thing. Six years of claymation football will mess you up. USC is no longer selling the Pete Carroll version of itself, the media companies. It's selling the post-clay version, although fortunately under new management, which is a little bit like selling to a TV executive a show featuring the 2022 version of Pam Anderson instead of the 1992 Baywatch version. And that's what makes the results of this study I'm going to tell you about so impressive. USC football is still USC football, as hard as Pat and Lynn and Clay tried to destroy it. According to a report from the University of California, USC's departure from the Pac-12 will mean an estimated loss in media rights of about $10 million per school for the remaining Pac-12 schools, or about 30% of the total value of each school's next media rights deal. UCLA's departure will cost a little over $3 million, or about 10% of the value. So what does this all mean? Well, first, USC athletics is three times more valuable than UCLA athletics. Now, being that some of that value must be attributed to basketball and conceding that UCLA basketball is a more valuable property, that means the difference between the football programs is at least three times greater, probably more. Shocking, right? I also expected the number to be dramatically larger. Now that USC has a real coach and is showing real commitment, the gap will grow. Now, the fact that USC is so much more valuable than UCLA isn't really the key part of this story. USC is known for Heisman's, national titles, first round draft choices. UCLA is known for none of those things. Of course, USC football is dramatically more valuable. No, this is what really makes the story strange to me. The day USC decides to walk out the door, the other Pac-12 programs lose 30% of their value and $10 million a year. Now think about what that means. 10 million per year, and there are three programs sticking around. Do a little simple arithmetic, and that means USC was donating to the rest of the conference about $100 million per year. Being that USC was bringing in a little over $30 million per year in its share of media payouts, that means USC was a $130 million plus program getting the same chump change as Wazoo. And about half that of Indiana and Purdue. What's crazy is not that USC is leaving the Pac-12. What's crazy is that USC stuck around so long. Because let's keep in mind that the Pac-12 never lifted a finger to help USC. When the NCAA was hammering USC with draconian penalties, because Reggie Bush was the 50th Heisman winner in a row to get impermissible benefits, what did the Pac-12 do? Nothing. Here's what the Pac-12 did. They sat in USC with officials that consistently, over the course of many years, had USC as the team in the conference with the largest disparity between penalties for and against. That was going on when Pete Carroll was around. I remember Pete complaining about it. I remember seeing the statistics then. They would schedule ridiculous midweek road games for USC. Why has the Pac-12 not won a national title since 2004? Because the Pac-12 would decide to do things like send USC to play a weekday, a weekday game in Corvallis at a stadium that requires two airplanes, three bus rides, and a covered wagon to get to. Therefore, a USC team that gave up nine points a game, like the 2018 did, these guys just talked about it a minute ago, which was a team that had the best defense in the last 25 years in college football, a team that beat Ohio State 35 to three, beat Oregon 44-10, Washington 56 to nothing, Notre Dame 38 to three, and UCLA 28 to seven, a team that shut out three opponents and held eight of their opponents to one score or less. A team like that doesn't get a chance to play in the national title game because of one loss, because the Pac-12 thought they should play a weekday game in Corvallis and 
because none of the writers or coaches believe that anybody in the Pac-12 other than USC was worth anything. So Oklahoma and Florida, they could get away with a loss. USC couldn't because all of the rest of you guys, the Pac-12 had one cash cow, one program that could deliver something on a national level. And in ain't Oregon, we know that. But the Pac-12 did nothing to help its flagship program. Instead, it took $100 million in charitable donations every single year, passed it around the conference dwarves, and acted entitled. USC was a world-famous rap star, touring the world, playing big arenas, going to hottest clubs, staying in the nicest hotels, flying in private jets, spending time with models, and the rest of the Pac-12 was that star's posse hanging around in the hotel with him and drinking his champagne, partying his, in his suite in Ibiza. And if that's who you are, if that's what you're about, you can at least understand the situation a little bit. Carry a bag from time to time. Keep the really crazy groupies away. Show a little bit of appreciation. But no, they take and take and take for years. All this time, USC, which is donating $100 million a year to these guys, is falling farther and farther behind its peers in the Big Ten and the SEC. And the Pac-12 little sisters of the poor keep collecting that charity money and do nothing to help their flagship program. Until one day, USC finally says, we've had enough, and they go elsewhere where they can collect something closer to their value. Still not their entire value, but closer to their value and maybe have some partners that recognize that value and maybe ask them from time to time what their opinion is or try not to saddle them with horrible, uh, horrible schedules that destroy the conference's opportunity to win a national title. And when this happens, what does a Pac-12 do? They complain. They release a statement saying they were shocked and disappointed. They act like they were stabbed in the back. USC didn't stab you in the back. They bought your house for you and both cars. They paid for your nose job and your wardrobe. You lived on their charity for years. You shouldn't be complaining. You should be apologizing. You should, be, you should have a giant garage sale so you can write a check to try to pay them back just a little bit of what you owe. And by the way, guys, you should have known this was coming. You saw what Texas and OMU did just a year ago. And if you were paying attention, you would know that an analysis done at that time found that Texas and OU leaving the Big 12 would cost the Big 12 about half of its media rights value, which seems to be about the going rate. If you lose a flagship program, you lose 25 to 30% or more of your conference's value. And if you lose a little brother program like UCLA, you lose another 10%. So Pac-12, you don't like the situation. Well, ask your new flagship program, Oregon, to help you out. Let's see if they're Let's see if the most prominent program in the country that's never actually won anything can carry you on their backs for a little while. I'm sure a new uniform combination should make up, should make up for that missing $100 million. Have a good time. All right. We thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, and with that, we transition to the fourth quarter. Panel ESPN's analyst, Kurt Herbstreet, has tweeted out that the Rose Bowl should be the permanent home of the college football playoffs uh, national championship game. Uh, what do you think of the national title game being held on New Year's Day? And do you think there is a reality to making this happen? Kevin, I know you've played in the Rose Bowl. Uh, you've been a national champion. What do you think of what Herb Street is uh, promoting here? Yeah, he, uh, as, a, as a big tenor, he, uh, uh, he loves a Rose Bowl, let's face it. So he's a bit of a homer on that deal, which I happen to concur with. I think the Rose Bowl as a venue on the 1st of January or thereabouts um, is with in combination of the parade and all the all the good stuff that's going on is just incomparable uh, in college football, which, oh, by the way, is the whole point about what we talked earlier with respect to uh, the amount of money that P1A uh, football can generate compared to other competitive products uh, such as NFL. Okay. So I, I like, uh, yeah, I'm, and, and look, I'm a homer too. I agree with it, but you know, unlike others, I can I fully admit to it and proud of it. Um, the Rose Bowl is a great place to play, except when UCLA is in there, you got to spray over that baby blue paint and all that crap. But uh, once you get that out of the way, you're all right. 
Um, it is a great place to play football, not so much for parking, but oh, I'll get over it. Uh, it's a great day on New Year's Day. It, you got the parade thing going on. You got good football going on. You've got you know flyovers from you know Blue Angels or whoever's you know you know in the Jets that day. Uh, you've got uh, you know Royal Seco with uh, you know uh, beautiful sunsets happening, and it's just it's just that's why people move out to Cal you know Southern California, um, and it's a great place to have a. Uh, uh, a playoff game. I, I, I think it's frankly um, incomparable. That said, um, pulling it off so we have all the, the 16 or 12 or 16 team playoffs and have it all get done by uh, first or second of January, uh, that, that that's a tall order. Uh, I'm not just sure how you execute that, but then there's some really smart people that could probably figure some of this out. <clears throat> right. But I would love to see that. I think it would be great for the sport. To tell you the truth, it'd be great for Southern California. Not so great for Dallas, which is where I live, but that's OK. I still have, have a lot of uh, good feelings toward uh, Rose Bowl, uh, which uh, counting the uh, high school games I played, I played in it seven times. Mark, can Mark, it happen or is this just fantasy fiction? I think you can definitely have the game at the Rose Bowl. I as far as hosting it on January 1st, that's a tall order. I mean, you either have to start the college football season earlier in the summer, in August, start playing the games when the NFL is playing their preseason games, um, which I don't think is a viable option just because of the way, you know, semesters and the quarter system is set up. Oh, no, wait, we're not going to confuse the NC2A and D1A football with student athletes. Let's just get that out of the way here, guys. This we've already talked about. We've taken the, the G well, out of the we're bottle. We're just throwing all the parameters so out the it, door. It's, yet, it's gone. Uh, it's it gone. Happen. It, look, we can you can pretend if you want. I mean, I'm not pretending. Do, I'm with you, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. And, and guys will get educations. So that's a wonderful thing. And it's fantastic. Sure. But this is not about student athletes anymore. Just, just drop it. Uh, there will be student athletes, and that's a that's a that's a good thing. So God bless them all. Uh, well, this is the D one A football. D one A football. It is a football program. It is competitive product, and it is it is hot. It is hot. Look, okay. if this is one way of keeping a little bit of a little bit of the tradition of college football married together. But yeah, and still connect, 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 up, connect, connect with the per, connect it with the parade, but the the, the, right. the traditions uh, that go with the various bowl games, all that that's gone. That's been gone for five, six, seven years, right? For the most part. Uh, so, oh well, let it go. Maximize the product that the, the guess, people I'm are going to pay for now. I know you are, I'm but the, board, maximize the product start. now. This is this is about maximization of value, right? And this is this is boy, this is right in my wheelhouse kind of stuff. You definitely are passionate about this one, Kevin. And yeah, you've got the helmet, so I'm going to stand back. Chris, sorry, are you? How, is it realistic to think that that they could actually say we'll play the national championship game on New Year's Day in the Rose Bowl, or is there just too many other people that say no, no? What about us? We're just we're the Orange Bowl. We're just as good, or we're the Cotton Bowl. We're just as good, etc. What do you think? Yeah. It there's no way that's going to happen. I would love to see it happen. There are two problems. You have the timing problem, which we've already talked about a little bit. When you think about it, to play to play that game on January 1st and have a four and have a four round playoff, which is what you're talking yeah. about, whether it's 12 or 16. That means that means there you're starting in early December and you're playing and you're playing the semifinals on Christmas Day. Uh, that that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and and there's no and and. While Pac-12, look, the other bowls that you just mentioned, the Orge, the Sugar, Fiesta, the Cotton, those are great bowl games that have their own great traditions. Are they as good as the Rose Bowl? No, of course they're not. They're not. But most of the country doesn't care about the Rose Bowl the way we do, right? I mean, the, the Big Ten and the Pac-12, they care deeply about the Rose Bowl. But if you grew up in the SEC, um, the Rose Bowl is a game you probably watch, but you don't feel the same way about it. There are a lot, there are a lot of other stakeholders who would have to get an agreement. And what's pro, what's almost certainly going to happen is sort of what they've been doing now, where you're playing semifinals and the and the championship game in the traditional bowls, even though they're going to be on on unusual days. Um, and then you're going to play the early rounds at the home stadiums of uh, of the of the higher seeded team. 
right? You're going to have to. The, there's a reason the NFL doesn't play the entire NFL playoffs at neutral sites. It's just not practical. You can't have fans. You can't have fans making four road trips during the playoffs to go to four different, not even knowing where they're going to go. It doesn't work. So they're going to have two rounds that are going to be played uh, at, at home stadiums. And they're going to have a semifinal and a final that rotate through the major bowls. The Rose Bowl is going to be one of them. And that game is going to be played sometime in the middle of January, not late January, or early February, because you're not going to compete with the NFL championship games and, and Super Bowl. It's going to be before that, but probably not too much before that. And that's how it's all going to shake out. And it'll make a boatload of money for everybody. Well, I'm going to agree with Chris on this one. Uh, I think it, if they do some backwards planning, there is that one out of 99 chance that they're going to use the Rose Bowl. But I, I think they want to move the national championship or a game around the country and have people bid on it and see. I mean, this is all about money to begin with, and they're going to try to get the most money without destroying a lot of the tradition. So, uh, uh, I yeah, there's, kind of there's, uh, hey, Greg, respectfully, I don't, there's not a lot of tradition. Uh, concern here uh, what we're talking about this is about enterprise value uh, tradition to the extent it drives enterprise value is fine if it doesn't get out of the way hey, that's where we are guys the genie's out of the bottle I'm telling you uh, this is a professional sport uh, and it's a great one you all agree with that yeah <laughs> yeah no it's clear I mean uh, look th this has already happened to some extent the or the 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 rose bowl has already lost a fair amount of its luster just over the last five or ten years right well, and if you go to Oklahoma play. yeah and and if you go to if you go to a 12 team playoff if the 12 if the top 12 teams are the uh, are in the on the playoff whoever's playing in the rose bowl if the rose bowl is not a part of the playoff is insignificant well, you, the, the Rose Bowl is going to host number 15 against number 19, and we're going to pretend like that still matters? No. It, his, the history is gone. College football can, can preserve some of its history. You can still have dotting the I. You can still have Traveler. You can still have Notre Dame versus USC. Some of that stuff will remain, and some of that stuff makes college football better than the NFL. But when it comes to the postseason traditions, dead. It's already happened. It's over. All right, one thing that's not over, but the word over, we're in overtime, okay? Uh, overtime, it's time to answer some viewer questions for panel answers in a free-for-all format. Folks, if you'd like to submit a question that we can answer or give you our opinions, just go to either the Gary P. or We Are SC members message boards at wersc.com. From there, you'll see the topic thread regarding questions for Inside the Trojans Huddle. We had a lot of questions this week. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so uh, again, it's a free for all uh, comment. Uh, panel, just jump in on it. Question one from SC, the one in the OC. I imagine that's Orange County. Panel, now that we are fully into fall camp and have the latest information from personal observations, coach and player interviews, what are your biggest concerns about this team at this point? I will not be shocked. I'll go first, uh, defense. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, because it's defense, especially the front seven. The secondary is going to be fine. There are a lot of good players in that secondary. But that front seven is very thin. That's yeah, I think Yeah, I think the defense is, is a, a big question mark, but I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, I, I think the uh, – and a lot of the concern was around linebacker play. We lack the depth on, on, the, on the defensive line. That's great. Good, good news is we run a 3-4. So we need three DLs. Uh, we need somebody to step up. And, and if Corey Foreman can't step up, somebody else is going to have to step up on the edge rush uh, pass. Um, Grinch uses a um, uh, a gap technique that, uh, you know, he'll let loose uh, Thule, uh and anything to showcase him um, is is what, what you're going to see uh, on defense. As long as Thule stays healthy, the defense will be healthy. The secondary will be reconstituted, rebuilt, and it'll be a lot better product, I should say product, a lot better uh, play uh, than uh, what we've seen for the last several years, uh, uh, frankly. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that part of it. The offense we know has got a lot of talent and, uh, and off we go. But the big question mark will be the defense. And uh, there it is. 
and, and I think everybody on this panel uh, would, I don't speak on behalf of anybody on the panel, but I think we've always, among ourselves, we've said, yeah, the defense is, boy, uh, there's there's some good talent there. I'm telling you, there's some really, and there's some, there's some guys that are just going to like surprise some people. I, I guess guarantee you that. But the Sean depth is the question. Sean New has said it best when I asked him the question last week. You know, he he loves his group. And I said, well, what don't you like? And it was just one word, depth. Yeah. It, that's yeah. the bottom line. You've yeah. got enough talent on the defense to get the job done, to hold teams to 25, 27 points a game. But once the attrition starts happening and those dominoes start falling as the season plays on, that's where things are going to get really dicey. Uh, you don't want Thule playing rush in because then you're, you're, you're taking him away from his strength. You want, well, no, but agreed. Know. You're right. You're right. Of course, as a general rule, but, but the amount of stunts and twists and different sure. movements and, and showcasing of, uh, of talent. When I watch Grinch's uh, play and play calling at, at OU, uh, he was very good about that. And uh, you're going to have uh, a newcomer. That's how you use Thule, and you got you got the tall linebacker Grant, who I think he's going to be a real he's going to be a real pain in the ass to this, some offenses. Uh, I guarantee you that Sean Lee is uh, or Shane Lee is going to be a good guy to get people in the right position. Uh, whether we play a gap or a man type defense, it, it honestly it, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, really, uh, it's a it's a question of being in the right being in the position. So I think the defense will be surprising. It is depth. There's no question. And a couple injuries. Uh, I'll, now, I'll tell you something else. Uh, there's a few injuries on offense that would do the same thing, too. All right. That kind of transitions. Uh, the question number three was from Corona Trojan fan in Vancouver, Washington. Would it be correct to say the biggest concern on defense is the position of rush end? Sounds like both Foreman and Height are injured. And if the only alternative is to have truly play at uh, position on occasion, that position on occasion, won't that considerably weaken the defense up the middle? Comments? That's not yeah. my biggest yeah. concern with the defense. Sure. I mean, I know that I know that I know that that Height and Foreman have both uh, have both sat out a lot more than the coaches want because coaches want guys practicing, they want guys getting better. I get that, but neither one of those injuries seems all that severe. I think those guys will play, and at least there you have especially if you if you include solo in that group you're going right. three deep with guys who at least have a lot of athletic ability whether they put it together or not i don't know whether they all stay healthy i don't know but should you at least have one or two of those guys healthy probably and then you're going to have you're going to have somebody at that spot who's big strong and fast that's better that's better than not having people that are big strong and fast that's not the position i'm worried about i i'm i'm far more concerned about losing a linebacker or two I mean, if, if Gentry goes down, if Shane Lee gets nicked up, I don't know what we have there. I mean, we have Rajon Davis, who was a talented kid who hasn't put it together yet. Uh, and you have Raylan Goforth, who hasn't shown me anything in the last couple of years. I think he'll be improved this year. It sounds like, it sounds like he's playing hard. I don't want to take anything away from the kid other than to say he didn't play particularly well the last couple of years. So I think that's my I think that's my bigger concern is is it linebacker and uh, and losing and the possibility of losing Thule, which other than losing Caleb Williams is the scariest prospect that that the coaches have to face this year. So those are the positions that worry me more. Here's what's going to happen with, with with this defense and with the staff. You're going to have a newcomer or a name that you know a lot of people might not be familiar with who's going to end up jumping up and being you know, the star, being a playmaker. Um, you know, Lincoln Riley talked about this after practice on Saturday. He brought up, um, what was that? The, the wide receiver, Hollywood Brown, Marquise Brown. He started off on the scout team. By the fifth game, he's the starter. By the end of the year, he's got, what, 1,100 yards of yak under him. So what Alex Grinch is looking at on the defense is, is are these guys tough enough? He's not married to any of these guys. And if he's finding guys that, you know, they're not going to, as Eric talked about in his article, if they're not going to strain and play through things, they're going to find players who will, you know, at the rush end right now, Julian Simon is running in the, in the two deep. And that's because 
Corey Foreman and Romello Height haven't been able to practice for whatever reason. Um, Solomon Bird, he's out there, but you know, I, I've seen I've seen a move. He's not a fleet of foot. He's not somebody you want to see at the rush end. I prefer him at defensive end. So this is again, it's about depth across the board of defense. Yeah. They have well, to I, move I, up at safety and at cornerback. Yeah, and I tell you that Grinch is less dependent on a rush end to put pressure on a quarterback than other defensive coordinators. Um, he, uh, he he loves uh, the, like the quick, it, aggressive, it, just create chaos in the backfield. That's what he yeah, wants. Yeah, I was going to say he, he he loves the twists uh, into the A-gaps, guys. So he'll he'll put a lot of pressure up the, up the middle. Okay. Um, that's why you're seeing guys yeah. like Dejon Benton moved up in front of Nick Figueroa. Right. Nick Figueroa is not a slouch. Just hey, that's a that's a great sign, right? I, I'm glad you brought that up, Mark. The fact that he's the fact that he's in front of Nick Figueroa is a very good sign because Nick Figueroa can play football at this level. Correct, right? absolutely. We know yeah. that. We know, and, that. and he's so and he's that's gonna that's and he's gonna, gonna and he's gonna play a lot of downs too. Yes, yeah. Nick, Nick will play. I'm, I'm 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 hurt and wounded that he changed his jersey number, but that's because he wanted mine. But there you go. <laughs> Yeah, this is all about a speed defense, and that's what they're looking for right now. Are the guys who are just who can get the well, job that, done. That's all well and good until you run up against Stanford, Notre Dame, and some guys that will just grind you into the ground. So you know, um, uh, find out. Look, looking at yeah, looking at how he plays, and I spent a lot of time on this. Uh, at least if OU is any indication of what we're going to see, and I got to think it is, um, then his, his his pressure techniques are. Uh, it, it, it's it's like the wild west guys it's there's always something going on up front and you know we're going to make some big plays in the backfield which will be great and we're going to give up some big plays but we were doing that anyway without making the big plays in the backfield so what the heck <laughs> all right guys question four from troy 70 and sunny and cool seal beach how much media value money does the ducks and huskies need to bring to the table to be invited to the big 10 don't see presidents voting them in if it means less money for them. Also, don't think other big uh, schools care to lose money just so SC and ruined players have shorter flights. Comment? How much does the NFL charge to be a to be a team? What's the entry fee right now? You got me. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's over, it's over a billion. Are you talking about an NFL team uh, franchise? Yeah. It's over a billion dollars. All right. That, well, that, Oregon, that's 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 your table stakes. If Oregon wants to be a member of the same conference with USC, they got to bring a half a billion to the table. Well, we we already Chris's analysis a little bit earlier, uh, you know, had uh, it was it was uh, ten million per team um, for the Pac-12, right? So it was about a hundred million bucks, and that was that was jump change, frankly. Here's, here's, the, thing. Way. here's the thing, though, guys. Uh, that only matters as long as the Big Ten is committed to parity within the conference. Now, when they when they brought in, my understanding is when they brought in Rutgers to Maryland, those two teams came in and they were not getting they were not getting the same amount that the other programs. But I think there was some understanding that they, that 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 would increase over time to where you have parity. At some point, that goes away. I think. I mean, once this once this becomes a once this isn't about the fact that, well, Minnesota, yeah. we've been in the same conference for 50 years. We're really good buddies. That, that sort of view of the world <laughs> is disappearing. And once it disappears, then, then Ohio State and Michigan and USC and Penn State are going to say, okay, why is it that Indiana is making the same amount of money that we are? Because if we got rid of Indiana, just throw them out of the conference and kept the same TV deal, and, and in awesome. Indiana doesn't change your TV deal. That's we, right. all make, we all make substantially more money. Okay. Once you do that, and once you have once you have people making more of an eat what you kill model, now it's easier to admit in Oregon because you can say Oregon has value. Oregon has TV value. As much as I hate them, they have television value. They probably don't have a hundred million dollars worth of value. It may be sixty million. Well, if everybody's making 100 million, you can't bring them in. But once it's clear that 
once it's clear that Oregon's going to get an amount of money that's consistent with its role in the world, then it makes sense to bring Oregon in because if you can get all of the major players in the SEC and the Big Ten, then those two conferences control everything. So I think there's going to come a day yeah. when, when, when and, and right now there are still enough have-nots in the Big Ten and the SEC that are fighting this and it hasn't happened yet, but it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time because, because the guys who make all the money are going to eventually call all the shots. And there's no reason Purdue should make as much as Michigan. It makes no sense. So once you fix that, you can bring in the other guys. And then you bring in the ones you need and you leave Wazoo and Oregon State to play with San Diego State. And you have, four, you have two, two 20 team super conferences that have their own playoff. And those 40 teams split everything. Which brings me back to one of my original points. USC has to beat Notre Dame every season. Okay. All, the the amount the number of reasons are uh, you can't even count them all. And I know they think the same. By the way. All right. Question five from David and Merced. We just got a couple more here. I think Kyle Ford is going to be a surprise breakout player for USC this season. In this offense, he should be able to get between six to eight yards, or excuse me, six to eight TDs. Who do you think will be a surprise breakout? Note from last week, I like uh, the R. Brown and Jacquees Rogers uh, comparisons. So who's the breakout player? I assume he wants uh, offense because uh, he, he slanted this in this offense. So who do you think's the breakout player? I don't know. Look, Kyle Ford's a talented kid, but there are a whole lot yeah. of wide receivers. Yeah, that, 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 that's we'll a talent-rich environment, environment yeah. which is a great thing for, for the team, frankly. Uh, I, and when you think about offensive players, I think about some of the running backs, um, the, a kid from Stanford and, uh, uh, and Ray Lake Brown uh, at, in a running back, you know, I'm not going to say hybrid, but put them in motion and just, just play with the defense. Drive the drive the defense nuts, ask a guy like that. Uh, whoever, oh my gosh, whoever gets an H back tight end role is also going to have a, a yeah. Great it, it, that's a really good point, Mark, because we've gone from uh, just because they're going to make you know, a catch. You know, we've gone from we don't you know, we don't need a tight end to oh my gosh, we're down to our last tight end. I mean, and we haven't even played it down in football. It's crazy, but uh, it, it just tells you how much uh, uh, impact you know. Uh, the approach to the game uh, uh, is, is has changed just in practice. We we we, do, we haven't seen it on the field yet, so that's really kind of interesting. I I thought with uh, with the injuries to the tight ends, I'm going to uh, you know a surprise breakout. I guess uh, I'll go with uh, Relique Brown only because he's a true freshman that hasn't played. So the surprise would be how much he gets out on the field. And breakout, yeah. how many opportunities will he have a chance to utilize his skills? So it's kind of more of a waiting game with him. But if I had to pick somebody, I would say really Brown. Yeah, I think Mario Williams is, he's not a sleeper, but he's certainly a guy that uh, Kayla Williams has got no problem going to all the time, all the time. And they know each other really well. You could just see that in the, that spring extravaganza whatever it was supposed to be called uh, on defense i love uh, i i think i i use the name grant it's actually it was gentry right it's the last name for the big tall kid from arizona yeah. i think this this guy is a game changer he is going to drive offenses just flipping nuts uh especially on third downs and 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 related uh i'm just i'm really excited to see him play Caitlin Bullock, too. I don't think for USC fans it's going to be a surprise but apparently for the rest of the country it's going to be because uh, he's not even getting uh, preseason Pac-12 uh, honors yeah. from people, and yeah. that's insane. That kid can play football, and he, he is can going ball. He can ball. Season. He can ball. You're right on that one. You're he's so already, right. Yeah. He's already bugging Jordan Addison and bugging Caleb Williams during practice. I mean, he's constantly spotlighted for making plays. Yeah, yeah. he's got to be because the, you know, his run support is. You, you you look at the pass cover, uh, and his run support is outstanding, and he's not a real big guy. Uh, I think he's put on a little bit of mass, but but his run support is extraordinary. Man, he can knock some guys backwards. He's incredible for for a guy as slight as his his build looks like. Another name tremendous range, right? I mean, this is yeah. a guy you put at center field, 
and there is no safe throwdown field. All right. he's, he's fantastic. I can't wait to watch him play this year. Yeah. Another guy on the defense, real quickly, that nickelback position, Max Williams. If he's healthy, Max, yeah. he is, he's going to remind people of Matt Grudiger. Yeah, yeah, that type of impact. Yeah, he, he's not quite the run stopper, Max, uh, that Matt but he, was. But no he is, he, no it, he's more of a Sue of Cravens type with a little bit more speed. If he doesn't get hurt, I hope he doesn't get hurt again. So he's something else. You're right. All right, two, two questions here that I think are good to wrap up on. Uh, this is uh, from Jonah, born and raised in Los Angeles. If Caleb gets injured early in the season, of course, let's hope not. How far do you think we could go with Miller Moss? Do we still make it to the Pac-12 championship? This is Jonah, born and raised in Los Angeles. Fight on. Sure. I, I think with Miller yes. Moss, they're, they're actually in, in good shape because uh, I think a lot of Miller Moss, the bigger question to me is who backs up Miller Moss if it happens. And here's what we find out is what kind of play caller does, does um, Lincoln turn into? Does he stay aggressive? Does he become more conservative? Because Miller is not the, I'll just use the term, he's not the athlete that Caleb Williams is. He's not going to be able to extend a play the same way that Caleb can. So this is that, look, this is a difference. Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams has an NFL arm too. The kid is special. But here's right. the, the difference. If you have Miller Moss in the game, you, you have a good quarterback and a smart kid and you have all kinds of weapons and you have what I think will be a good offensive line, you're still going to score a lot of points. The thing you don't have is you don't have that you don't have that constant threat where the quarterback can go 80 yards on you. You can do everything else right. right. And Caleb Williams can go 80 on you. Yeah, And that's a huge problem for a defense, just an enormous problem. We've seen it over the years. Pete Carroll had some great defenses and you run up and you go up against these really mobile quarterbacks and, and they would even get Pete fits because it's yeah. hard to scheme that it's hard to scheme that problem. It's a pain so in the ass. Good. It's a pain in the ass to yeah. have a, a, a quarterback that can do that to you. And you don't, you don't put a spy on a, if you put a spy on a quarterback, I guarantee you, that it's a rare day when you're going to win that football game, right? Because you're taking away a defensive player that's got to do some other things, and it's going to open up a whole lot of other, you know, uh, opportunities for that offense. Um, yeah, so that's that's the difference there. Well, I'll give I'll give Miller Moss this look. He can throw fade. He can he he's got all the throws, uh, and he's he, he's got a good arm. You know, he's got an arm. He can throw to the boundary. He can do those kinds of things, and that's great. It's going to that then requires that the running backs step up and really provide a pass pro and B that they uh, they, they 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 run uh you know run the ball effectively. And you know, I'm still waiting for that to happen again. Miller's a different quarterback than what Lincoln has had in his you know at Oklahoma. The, the previous quarterbacks he's had are are considered more mobile. Jalen Hurts would be the least mobile of, of his quarterbacks that he's had. You think you think. No, I mean, Baker Mayfield, probably. Mayfield can yeah. move around a little bit. Mayfield wasn't a guy who was going to go 80 on you. I mean, no. He wasn't that kind of mover. But um, he but, could extend the play. Feet. Yeah, it could feed. Yeah. He'd break it down. He could break it down. Okay, our final question, and I think I particularly like this question. It's a short, quick answer. This is from JCW, USC in Palm Desert. When SC begins Big Ten play in 2024, which Big Ten team would you like to see the Trojans face in their first home and away game? I will give my answer and let you guys chime in the rest of the way. I would like to see the first home game against the Big Ten team. I want Ohio State to come to the Coliseum. And the first away game, I'd like to see USC go to the University of Michigan and the Big House. Have at it, guys. See, I'm going to flip it. I want to go jump around in the fourth quarter at Wisconsin on the first roadie. And has Michigan, when was the last time Michigan visited the Coliseum? You know, the last, honestly, I the wasn't last alive. time, the last time that I believe the Michigan came to the Coliseum, I actually took a team that I was coaching to see them play UCLA back in the seventies, early seventies. That's the last so time. Play, Michigan they haven't played USC. So. No, but that you, the question was, you, I think you asked when's the last time they played in the Coliseum. 
And that was last I, I remember Michigan being in the Coliseum. I should have think Mark's got a good point that I like to see Michigan come out and uh, on a on home and home and home uh, situation and then and then follow on with a go visit the big house or vice versa. I don't care. I mean, either, yeah. either way, play play in front of 106,000 screaming fans. It's, it's a lot of fun. Ohio State's the best program out there right now. And so in some ways, that's the game that I most look forward to. But I've seen USC play Ohio State in person multiple times, including twice at the Coliseum. I haven't seen that from Michigan. I've even seen Penn State at the Coliseum. I have not seen Michigan there. So that's a game I'd like to see. Uh, road game, the big house would be great. But, uh, you know, a whiteout game at Penn State would, uh, would be pretty cool, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Since USC would be wearing their road whites also. No. Well, they might cut a deal. They need to negotiate uh, jersey numbers. I would love to see Cardinal and Gold <laughs> at a whiteout. That would be like what, really whiteout number 80. <laughs> well guys i think that uh, it is going to be interesting in 2024 to see what schedule gets released uh again a reminder if you have a question or comments for our panel go to either the we are sc message boards and click on the thread that uh, pertains to inside the trojan subtle viewer or listener questions and before we sign off again next week we'll begin our quote regular coverage of usc uh uh, in the inside the Trojans huddle and the format will be just slightly adjusted to that. Uh, so with that in mind, it's a wrap for this edition of inside the Trojans huddle. Big thank you to this week's panel of greatness, meaning Mark Culkin, Chris Arledge and Kevin Bruce. And a special thank you to all of you for watching or listening to inside the Trojans huddle until next Tuesday. This is your host, Greg Katz, reminding you all to fight on everybody.